let me say a few things about the media. The media. Well, first of all, the media makes a lot of mistakes. Does anyone see the stuff on the right? The left, brother? <laughs> yes, thank you. Right. So, yes, there is a Tripoli in Libya, in, in Lebanon, rather, but it's not what they're talking about. They're talking about Tripoli. So you have here CNN, the premier news channel of the world, covering developments in Tripoli about Gaddafi's whereabouts, and give us a, give us a map of Tripoli in Lebanon, and they have their correspondent apparently there. I hope for her that she's in Libya. <laughs> something else. But, but this is, I mean, this is just a vignette. I mean, you have so many things we've seen mistakes like. But it's an indication that if we are to cover and understand and work now to fix issues, we really have to know the history, the geography, the facts. There, I've seen so many of these in the past couple of years, as I'm sure you have yourself. On the other side, you have the media oftentimes playing a political role. I'm putting Al Jazeera here because Al Jazeera's case is very interesting. In the early phase, it plays a very positive role. It's beaming the revolutions, left and right, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, Egypt, Tunisia. But increasingly, and I think there's a general sense about this in the Arab world, increasingly they become politicized. They don't cover so well what's happening in Bahrain. They kind of mute about it a little bit. They play a strange game vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Increasingly, people are starting to ask questions. It's only one channel among many. There's several other channels, of course. New ones emerging, and it's a good thing that there's a proliferation. And if one doesn't like Al Jazeera, they can watch something else. But what's interesting, so to speak, is that these, this politicization of the media is also part of the story. We can't simply say the media have played a role, the e revolutionaries, these technologies are something, it's what you do with them. And I use Al Jazeera in particular because Al Jazeera, in the first five, six years from 97, let's say, to 2001, 2002, was a major revolution in the Arab world. They were breaking taboos, they were discussing everything. Some of you that might be familiar with some of the programs remember what, what they used to cover in terms of everything uh, early on. Re reductionism, politicization, but also faulty forecasts. This is also something that struck me. This is February, March of last year. We have everything, everybody's enthusiastic about the changes. And the cover of this major international paper is that Islamism is completely lost. This is the same Islamism, by the way, which six months later will win elections in about four countries. So, so much for forecast. Because it's about projecting values. Because the liberal perception is that this is about all about the youth, the Islamists are lost, there's a new day. Well, yes, the revolution is well led by the young revolutionaries. But what we have seen now, clearly, is the success of Islamists for obvious reasons. Better organized, been there longer, more able to use, and in fact, quite honestly, opportunistic about it, as we've seen. But to have such a projection so immediately misleads our analysis because we might think the Islamists are out of power, uh, out of the sequence, when in fact they can come back very quickly and, and, and take over. Whereas for me, I think the real question is, is here. Do we have a rupture here in the perception of an earlier phase where, again, this is a media, Western media for that matter, focusing too much on particular individuals are representative of an order, whether a nationalist, police state, or religious project, to the multiplicity that comes with the last picture. It's more about the values behind that, so to speak. Do we have a rupture between three and four is my point. Echoing the first couple of slides I showed you earlier about the uh, world transforming and the transformed uh, world. So the question I put to you, have we made too much out of these e-revolutionaries? Where are they now? How come they have not been able to succeed? Is this actually a good thing that for them that they have to reorganize to kind of uh, feed back what they've done into the system? Or is it simply something that is objectively limited by virtue of this moment and the forward movement issue that I discussed? Questions that I'm asking to you for us to discuss later on. Now, last uh, pillar of the discussion that I'd like to put out to you. This is really what I think has been missing in the discussion. Transitions. And here, um, I often have a, a I, I work as, as, as I mentioned on these issues, and recently, for instance, we organized a major uh, meeting in Amman, Jordan, with some 70 representatives from, from civil society, 
from Morocco to Libya, Yemen, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, Iraq, all over the region, Lebanon. And the idea was to look at what's been transforming. And interestingly, the key aspect that I found missing is the comparative notion. By that I mean that the Arab Spring experience would be better understood and worked with, even at the level of actors, if we put it in the context of understanding what took place in Latin America in the 70s, 60s, 70s, southwestern Europe, Spain, Portugal, Greece in the 70s, eastern Europe in the 90s, how did they themselves go from post pre-1989 to post-1989? What actually took place? Alliance making, repositioning, party uh, repackaging, letting go of the old system, creation of a new culture, place of religion, these things have happened elsewhere. I think focusing on the exceptionalism of the Arab Spring is a form of cultural, in fact, reading of it. It's a form of neo-Orientalism, I would argue to you. That this is a region that have its own specificities. No. This is about a universal process, which has a specific political history, which I explained, but we have now to understand it in relation to this. Now, let me take you a little bit, and please indulge this uh, summer afternoon, which I know is tiresome for all of us, but we're working towards a break here. Um, please indulge a little bit of this transitology. First of all, the process is different from the goal. It may seem straightforward, but I don't think we have seen too much in the coverage or even understanding. Moving towards democracy as an elusive, complex goal is different from the goal itself, which even when it's achieved in the West, you can backtrack and fall from. Look at the rise of the right wing in Europe. Look at the situation in the United States. There's a real sense of loss of democratic values. The French speakers among you, I recommend Todorov's excellent new book, uh, Les Ennemis de la Démocratie, which came out in January or February. Excellent book that really makes the, the case that today the major enemies of democracy are those that are within the democracies and not those that are without it. Um, Todorov, I'm sure, the, the, the Eastern European philosopher. What is the process about? It's about conflict. It's about competition, change, instability, disorder. It's a non-linear process. To think that we move in a linear way towards democracy is to be naive about it. It just doesn't happen. Which means here that performance is central. Agency. What happens during the transition is what makes the transition. Might be tautological, but that's exactly what it is. How you manage it is central. It's an open-ended attempt. And I highlight the time because, as I said, it may very well fail. There's some implications. First of all, what are the ingredients in the transitology? There's two key words there. There's Dan Rosto, Transition to Democracy. Dan Quart Rosto, R-U-S-T-O-W. His major article, 1970, Transition to Democracy. And there's Samuel Huntington. I know, I know. He's written other books. A good political scientist, but he had a pre clash of civilization life. And he's written an excellent book called The Third Wave. Really good, and an even better one Political Order and Changing Societies, in which he engages with that. Take a look at Sam Huntington's Political Order and Changing Societies and his Third Wave and Dan Rustler's work, and many others for that matter that have been engaging in this debate. What are the things that are necessary? It's not the level of culture, it's not the level of economics, but fundamentally, we often think that development has to come before. What he, at the end of this statistical study that he makes, looking at a number of, of, of cases, what you need is two things. One is national unity. Fundamental. It might simple. Simple, but you need the Zantani, the, the Benghazi, the Tripoli, to think of themselves as Libyan to have that unity to move forward. Otherwise, you're in isolated, atomized political realities. And you're thinking in different ways. You're not thinking think at, at, at that level. There's a course of action. There's an interplay between structure and agency. Things have to be built, constitutions, elections. There's a whole debate about elections. Again, I'll be happy to discuss with you. Do we need them early or later? Very, very important tactical question about that. Um, and ultimately, as I would argue personally, there is a universal framework for transition. I really believe that is strong, and I've been debating it in several places where people are thinking, well, there's the Western mode, and there's the Eastern mode, and the Latin American. I think that there's a universal process of transition, which is about basic values. that have to be contextualized, of course, in a specific history, 
and informed by performance of the local actors. But to think simply that this, and even when you factor in religion for that matter, I think that the Islamists that you find today in Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, if they do it well, can only end up in AKP territory, the Turkey type, but I think they can very well be like Christian Democrats in the future within a democratic setting. But it's about performance and about the choices they will make now as such. Or they can fail and be replaced, which could also be good for the democracy as such. The universality aspect, I'd like to hear you about that afterwards. Um, the actors of the transition, they're these people. Three key actors, the state. The state as the object of reform, but also as the driver, seat, fundamentally. It's the starting and ending point of transition. And it's all those elements in italics about that need to be. Civil society is central to the transition. Wherever we look, Eastern Europe, it played a key role. Latin America played a key role. The Arab world today played a key role. Sub-Saharan Africa in the 90s. Think about Benin, Senegal, Mali, Ghana, places that advanced on the basis of a lot of good civil societies. All of that world is always present. And the people too. The people which are the seat of the transition and are there who can adapt. The challenges, basically three key challenges. Disenchantment. This is the most pernicious, vicious element that can come very quickly. All of this for that, very quickly you can have that. Disenchantment kicking in. A place like Tunisia, which I think is doing pretty well, and I will, in my book is the success story so far, there's a danger that as it moves on, there's a disenchantment <coughs> kicking in. And I think we have to be very realistic about that. If it's gradual or rapid, and it can lead to radicalization, of course. Exclusion, that's also a big danger. What will happen in Syria once Assad goes, since he will go? When, when he goes, how will the new Syrian Democrats behave? Will they embrace all the Syrians? Or will you have a witch hunt against everybody that is suspect, suspected rightly or wrongly to have at some point been with Assad? Alawi or not? As we've seen in Iraq, Sunni Shia, and as we've seen in other places. You know, La Terreur in France followed uh, 1789. That's what you had, with 20,000 people killed. So it's part of human nature, and it's very, and of course, the ill treatment of minorities as such. How, and how can they find their place within the new situation? The Copts in Egypt is an example that comes to mind. Others, the Berbers in Libya. And diffusion is also a more difficult to, to handle, but it's a threat. The fact that today, I think this wave of transition is very much influenced externally. The United States, France, Germany, Turkey, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, regionally, the transnational, but also the overflow, as we will see in a moment. That is a very, very dangerous way to, when you're building a local story, to have those elements. How are we doing in terms of time now? Let's go. Uh, what time is it? Sorry. 3.15. Should I, should I finish this? I have about another 5-10 minutes or do you want a break? Should I continue? You guys, this is a democratic setting, so <laughs> let me just finish and then we can have a long break and we can have a discussion. I'm just going to cover this and then some security aspects. Um, I want to keep you with me and I think I know it's always difficult to learn. So the sequence is this, as we've seen it in transitology, and I'm summarizing a lot of materials, but it comes down to this. National unity is the, the zero level, shall we say, or level one. Second one is a lot of work about creating a new reality. This is what Tunisia did well last year. They created three committees, commissions rather, uh, which they put together prostitutional work, um, um, corruption uh, issues from the past, and, um, and rights and justice issues. So this is needed work that has to move towards a third level, which is that you need a little bit of peace. Violence has to come down to a manageable level. If it doesn't get to that level, think about Libya, then you're not really doing too much of a transition because you're managing the violence itself day in, day out. And I'm using Libya as an example because there's a whole debate there, as I'm sure you followed, that the recent elections solved everything. But just over the past three days, we had a lot of violence as such. Bombing, uh, there's been a, a riot in a prison, and there's been a, 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 another incident uh, in relation to that. Fourthly, political stability. 
You need people to agree with the rules and work with them. And finally, a level of societal consensus. So that you get to this structure, ideally, the most important one is phase one. Again, this is where Tunisia is today. Ben Ali is dead. Oh, he's not dead. I'm sorry. He's out. <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> um, he's away. In fact, it's good that he's away in, in a peaceful manner. He's out of the system. The gates are open. Everybody goes into the gate. Islamists, liberals, women's groups, Salafists. Everybody engages in this prolonged period of political and ideological competition. Keyword competitions. Playing by the rules. This is, what, again, what Tunisia did well, because even when the Islamists won, everybody agreed to that. There was a lot of debate and resentment by some groups, and we've seen them, but they agreed to play by the rules. And this creates a precedent. Then you need a second, and a third, and a fourth election. But this is where phase two, which comes down the road, is the institutionalization of these procedures that find their way through our societies, so that the citizen engage with the state with a new reality, no longer fear, and arbitrariness and favor, but its rights, representativity, legitimacy. Much, much, much later, and none of these countries is there, is the normalization habituation phase, where people get even bored about democracy. And you can have a different type of threat. Where... Now, interestingly, and I put this in italics, and this is why sometimes it's confusing, if, is, if, this, if the process is too much controlled, then it's not democratic. You need to leave it open so that it can define itself as such. Um, you cannot sort of remote control it in a way that you think that you're doing the right thing while in fact pre-programming it. 